Hi, I'm Deanna Joe, and welcome to my channel, Responsible Faith. Today I want to talk about spiritual abuse from the angle of grooming and gaslighting. Now, gaslighting is a term that comes from the 1944 Alfred Hitchcock film called Gaslight, and he actually adapted that from a 1930s play. But it was about a wealthy woman, and in the movie she was played by Ingrid Bergman, and she marries a thief who attempts to steal her valuable jewelry collection. And so he frequently sneaks up into the attic when he's supposed to be out of the house and he searches for it. And every time he goes up, he turns the gas lights on. Well, when he does, the gas lights downstairs dim. And so she sees the dimming lights, she hears the noises up in the attic and she wonders what's going on. So when she mentions it to him, he of course wants to continue his search and so he convinces her it's all in her imagination there's nothing happening and he kind of starts treating her like she's losing her mind like she's hearing things and seeing things and that gradually makes her start to question her own reality and eventually she questions her own sanity now, the Newport Institute defines gaslighting as a form of psychological manipulation where the abuser will attempt to sow self-doubt and confusion in their victim's mind. And typically, gaslighters are trying to avoid responsibility. They're looking to gain power and control over the person by distorting reality and forcing them to question their own judgment and intuition. And obviously, gaslighting is a form of emotional abuse. Now, another term I want to define here before we get underway is grooming. And I know when you mention grooming, people automatically think of sexual abuse, especially sexual abuse of children. But it kind of is a tactic that's used in other uh, abusive and manipulative scenarios as well. And it's just the gradual process of pushing healthy boundaries to prepare or coach someone into accepting unhealthy experiences or ideas that they would normally resist. And this is done by disarming them, by wearing down their natural defenses, over time and there are tools that groomers use one of course is establishing trust and they will love bomb people they will make people feel special or superior typically groomers will see a need in a person and they will feel that need and so they make themselves important to that person that way they also as time goes on they they kind of work at isolating the person Often they will use guilt. You know, there's all kinds of ways that people will groom someone. And so I want to talk about these topics today in regards to how they look in the church. High control churches are grooming grounds for spiritual abuse. And I don't know if you've ever attended one, if you've ever disagreed in one, if you've ever had to point out abuse in one, or even if you've ever left one you have likely experienced gaslighting and you've definitely experienced grooming. Now, high control churches and pastors do not recognize healthy boundaries. They will invade every aspect of your life if you allow them and then turn around and treat you like the dysfunctional one if you resist. The gospel is the centerpiece of traditional, normal Christianity. But unhealthy churches complicate faith by adding unnecessary layers of control through church rules and traditions. Now these rules are often just the leader's personal preferences being presented as being biblical, and they'll do this by taking bits and pieces of scripture out of context, or taking a scripture to the absolute extreme that they think it could possibly mean. And some will even reinforce the rules by pretending to have received a direct word from God. You know, the Lord spoke to me and said, <laughs> whatever, fill in the blank. And so that makes it sound like God's obviously endorsing whatever it is they're, they're saying. And so that it, it convinces people and it scares people because nobody wants to go against God. And so in churches like this, the rules and traditions end up becoming the centerpiece. Now, if you say that to them, they'll deny it. They'll say, no way, you know, it's Jesus. But all you have to do is listen to them talk, watch what they value, and what they celebrate and you can easily see that their rules and traditions have become the centerpiece. 
High control groups groom their followers to view the leader as the man of God, and they will assign him almost cult-like power and reverence, making him virtually untouchable. He is to be submitted to because, of course, he's presented as being spiritually superior from everyone else. He's divinely appointed. He, he's hearing directly from God, and he speaks the mind of God. When your pastor gets up and speaks as the voice of God, please don't question your pastor. He's simply parroting what God tells him to say. I heard one time what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, now I'm sending you out to preach my word. And he put it this way. If they hear you, they have heard me. And this is where people get mixed up because he, they look at the pastor. And the pastor has flaws. And, and the pastor forgets things. And he forgets birthdays. And he says things sometimes that are insensitive. But if that man is anointed of God, you can tell when God is preaching through that man. And you may look at the man, but recognize, get past the way he looks, get past any shortcomings, get past the sound of his voice. You're hearing the voice of the great shepherd. They said, Pastor, whenever you pray, whose voice do you hear? I said, I hear the voice of God. They said, what does he sound like? I said, my pastor. So my question to you is, because that is how Samuel knew that that was the voice of God, and that because when God spoke to him, he went to Eli, which was his pastor. Why did he go to Eli three times when he's hearing the voice of God? Because, see, the voice of God sounds like your pastor. So if it's not my voice you hear when you're praying, that means you've made somebody else your pastor, and you're under a different head, and you have no authority, and you're confused, and you're in trouble. So you're the most wonderful people in all the world. You know how I know that? Because pastor said so. And the pastor said so. That's law. So they turn him into this larger than life figure. And it goes beyond just normal respect that a person would have for a pastor. We ought to be reverent of the man of God. He is exactly what the title implies. He has given his life to serve the Lord. He is God's representative and he stands in the gap between us and eternal life. Just much like in the scriptures that we read in the very beginning, in the book of Genesis, when God had, 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 had uh, sent man away from the garden, he drove Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, and to protect the way to the tree of life, the Lord put an angel to stand in the middle, separating man from the eternal tree of life. It was never God's intention for the sin of man to continue on for eternity. And so God sent an angel. He put an angel in the midst. Now that angel, the definition of an angel, is a messenger of God. Normally when we think of angels, we think of uh, those winged spiritual beings, uh, fiery ministers of God. Well, that may be true on one hand. There are some spiritual messengers of God. But on the other hand, there are some natural or human messengers of God. Just much as like in the book of Revelation when it talked about the, um, the angels of the seven churches of Asia. These were pastors of these churches. Amen. So a pastor is a messenger of God. And in that, in that response, he is an angel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So God set an angel to separate man or to stand in the gap between man and the tree of life. And he put a, a flaming sword in his hand. And the, Bible and the Bible describes the Bible as the sword of the spirit. And so man in his natural sinful condition can only get to the tree of life by going by that angel with the flaming sword. You know what that means? That means you need a pastor in your life. Everyone needs a pastor in your life who has been commissioned of God to help us reach heaven and make it our home. So we need to esteem him. We need to hold him up in reverence as the man of God. And then in this scenario of this high control church, then there's you, you know, you're the lowly saint, you're told that you need lead, and you can't trust your emotions, you can't trust your mind, they love to mention the verse where your heart is deceitful above all things. Now, interestingly, in these scenarios, the pastor's heart is not deceitful above all things, just yours. So you can't trust yourself, but you can totally trust him. And they really zero in on submission, like you're to submit to the pastor because he watches and cares for your soul. And so this makes saints fiercely devoted to their pastors. 
fawning over him and almost obsessed with his approval. And I, I have seen saints that were so obsessed with their pastor's approval and what would he think and all this stuff that they almost seem like they don't really consider God in the mix. It's just really more about pleasing this pastor. And the whole idea that he watches and cares for your soul, I don't know if I'm just cynical, but I've probably had about nine pastors in my lifetime. And I, I have to be honest, I don't really feel like any of them really cared much for me that way or the other. I mean, they had nothing against me, but I don't, I never really got the impression it was this deep personal love they had for me. They were just doing a job and that was that. And I've, I've always thought if you think your pastor is madly in love with you and just cares so deeply for you, withdraw your money. That would be the test because you might find out that that love was a lot more transactional than what you thought. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. High control ministers preach grooming sermons to build their church culture. Now, obviously, they preach the fear-based, try-harder sermons where they point out every flaw and failure that you might have, how you're falling short of all these rules and traditions. And then, of course, why that's dangerous for you. Well, you know, if you cut your hair, your husband's going to cheat on you or whatever, you know, or they tell they tell the gory stories of, you know, so-and-so left this truth and now they're, you know, picking bottles in the ditch. I don't know. Like, it's always, it's always some horror story to scare people into not, leaving or not asking questions. So fear is very important for them to maintain control. And they also preach the boastful loyalty sermons. I mean, this is going to sound familiar to some of you for sure about how superior they are, their group is because of their unique rules and traditions. And they'll, they'll call it the truth. And I used to think that was just something that my previous group did. But I've heard it in other groups as well. And I thought, oh, okay, so this wasn't just us. And this is where they're just, I love the way we look. And I love the way, you know, and I, I'm proud to whatever, scream and holler and run in circles, whatever it is. But they, they, they really cheerlead um, and brag about how special they are, basically. And then there's the sermons where they present an exaggerated concept of Christian leadership and submission. There are some, some pastors that, I mean, they are hard. There is no give, and it's almost like, like, like they're a dictator. But yet for that church, they're the man of God. I, you know, there, there's some things that, that stories that I've heard that there's some of you couldn't take it if you had a pastor. And I'm, I remember, I remember Brother Parker that just recently passed away. I remember him telling the story of being in Brother Terry's church. And he was maybe having some problems with a little bit of rebellion. And so, you know, what, what would some of you do if Pastor got up here behind the pulpit and somebody was, was having a little bit of a pity party and being offended? And, and he called. Now I'm trying to think who I can call out without without offending somebody. And pastor called out and said, Brother Tim Moran, Brother Tim Moran, you get up here. Yeah, we'll play this thing through. Get down on your knees and bark like a dog. Thank you. So that's what... So that's what. Thank you, Pastor. So that's a that's a reaction that we should have, Brother Terry. And I don't know as if Brother Terry was a hard man. I, you know, I think he could have been hard in some ways. But you know, how many of you would stand if that happened to you in the middle of church? You know, there's some we would lose you. 
There's some we've lost that a whole lot less than that happened. Are you going to stand? Well, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Are you going to stand? Now, imagine within this dynamic I just described, a problem arises, like a real problem. What are you going to do? You know, do you dare question or disobey God's appointed authority? Or, you know, would you dare disagree if his teaching was not biblically sound? Or what about abuse? Would you dare call out abuse in leadership? Be careful to guard your tongue. Amen. That is so important that we take special care not to judge the man of God, not to accuse him, not to second guess him or speak evil of him. The scriptures declare that it is not good to lay your hands on the man of God. Touch not God's anointed. That's not only physical, but that's also verbal, too. So we need to take these things into account in our relationship in dealing with the man of God in our lives. God takes his gifts very seriously. I mean, the Bible says, touch not mine anointed, you know, and it also talks about gossip, which, you know, some of these things, like I know of people who have experienced legitimate abuse in churches, and they have heard that gossip thing peddled out in, in a way that's misrepresentative, I think. And they're terrified. They're terrified to, to say anything out loud. I've had people share things with me and you could tell they, they just were scared to even breathe the words out loud because they were so afraid they would be gossiping. Let me tell you something about gossip in the way that it's presented in some churches. Gossip can save your life. You need to know if someone's a creep. You need to know if somebody uh, has been arrested previously for sexually abusing children if you have children in a church. There are times you need to know things about people to keep yourself safe. And so biblical concepts like gossip get weaponized in high control groups. And this entire arrangement is just a fantastic way to totally erase accountability. And then of course, you know, if you leave and you speak up, well, now you're an outsider, you're a bitter backslider and nobody wants to hear anything you have to say. So from start to finish in a high control church, no matter what hierarchy or reporting system they claim to have in place, there is not one ounce of actual accountability in the type of church or organization that I just described. And that, that can be very dangerous. Now, my background is United Pentecostal Church International and I only mention them because that is my experience and so when I give examples that's what I can draw on but I'm in no way implying that the UPC has cornered the market on grooming and gaslighting I'm just you know because I've seen it in other churches it's an across-the-board problem but I just will probably use a lot of examples from the UPC in this video because it is what I know so in the UPC they say they don't believe in authoritarian control but in pastoral authority. And I mean, I've heard them say it over and over. I've heard David Bernard, the general superintendent of the organization. I've had him say it to me personally in conversation, but their version of pastoral authority is authoritarian control. And we have, if we're gonna love the body, we have to have Christian liberty. The opposite of that is authoritarian control and abuse. There's no, we believe in strong spiritual authority and pastoral authority. We believe a pastor can set guidelines that the whole church should follow. But we don't believe in abusive authority. CollinsDictionary.com defines authoritarian control as a person or an organization controlling everything rather than letting people decide things for themselves. Scripture is the authority for us as Christians. So when a UPC pastors are allowed to make guidelines beyond Scripture and their saints are expected to adhere to them, which they are because they have to submit to the pastor, that is authoritarian control. So something that comes out of that is the extra biblical rules and traditions result in them policing and judging one another. And because of that, many of them develop poor interpersonal boundaries 
and it has created um, an unhealthy culture of bullies who never get corrected because honestly they feel like they're doing the Lord's work by sticking their nose in everybody's business basically you know you're not keeping this rule or this this is uh, something that you need to do and the high control ministers become so invested in the minuscule details of their members lives that they have become nothing more than busy bodies at this point I'm gonna tell you something facial hair is not Apostolic, however you want to cut it, it's compromise. I don't care if your leader says you can wear a beard, honey. Beard's nothing more than pride. You're not going to be dipped in Holy Ghost oil and run around looking like the world. having opinions about everything from whether men should be allowed to wear facial hair to you know whether married people can wear wedding rings to if a woman can wear a little bit of makeup to whether or not you can change jobs or move or sell your house or go on vacation and you know they treat their saints like children so you might say well you know that would be a little annoying but what really is the harm in it well i'll tell you the harm the gospel is not central in any of these high control groups. Man is exalted. And there's often just enough biblical wording in a lot of these sermons that if you don't look too closely at the context, you could easily be persuaded that what they're saying actually is in scripture and it's biblical. And also they exercise an unhealthy amount of control over your life. And some groups, and this would include my former group, the UPC, they will pump up the emotional level of the service with loud, fast music, screaming, aggressive preaching. Um, they'll encourage extremely demonstrative worship. I can't tell you how many services I've been in where people were just normally worshiping the Lord and they would get up behind the pulpit and start screaming, you know, you call that worship, you know, <laughs> worship like you mean it. And, and like just uh, cheerleading and pumping and almost shaming people into going berserk, basically. That's okay. I'll get excited by myself. Woo! When their team wins, they run! Am I right? They run onto the court. They run onto the field. If they can run on the court, I can run in the house. If they can run on the field, I can run in the aisle. Pentecost code has an aisle wide enough for two-way traffic to run.
After a couple of hours of this intensity, people are worked into a frenzy and their heightened emotional state makes them way more suggestible. So people will feel like they felt things, and they think it's from God, but it's not really. Or they'll think the pastor is anointed in whatever he's saying because they felt goosebumps, not realizing how much background music and, and how much just um, outward stimuli has kind of gotten them to this point. And I've even seen pastors preaching something that they could tell wasn't going over well. Maybe they were correcting or, or being mean about something or even preaching just something weird. <laughs> and you could feel like you could tell they felt the resistance and they would just go into this little performance where they would start shaking and speaking in tongues right in the middle of what they were saying. And of course, that was to signal God's endorsement, right? Look at me, I'm overcome with the Spirit. You know, the Lord's just speaking through me. And so then that makes people think, well, I mean, this must be from God. <laughs> Look at him, you know, and it's very manipulative. And it can be difficult for people especially in this environment, to distinguish the difference between a spiritual experience and just emotional excitement generated by a host of external stimuli. You know, background music, people crying, people praying loudly, like just the emotions of other people would affect your emotions. But if people think that God is in your services, they're more likely to believe and obey whatever you tell them because they assume that, well, if God is here, then he must agree with and endorse whatever it is you're teaching. Invasive church rules added to authoritarian uh, views of pastoral submission within a highly emotionally charged environment is the perfect formula for spiritual abuse and i personally think the upc has a big spiritual abuse problem simply because of those three factors working together so often in so many of their services and conferences camp meetings i mean just go on youtube look them up so what i shared touches on grooming but let's talk about gaslighting when you challenge these rules and traditions in one of the high, these high control groups, it is very common to get negative responses, negative pushback, which I mean, that's normal. If somebody, if somebody disagrees with you, most people will kind of respond in a way that, you know, they defend their position. But I find that you can also get manipulative responses. And that's more where I want to zero in today. And I'm going to give you three examples. And so my first example is I have found that some will define holiness by their personal comfort level with an issue, but they'll present it as a matter of salvation. And so these are people who have very black and white thinking They're, They have no room for personal convictions, no room for Christian liberty. And people like that are often very angered and very threatened if you bring up questions or if you disagree with them and they will push back hard <laughs> uh, i speak from experience ad hominem attacks are common and this is where instead of properly addressing the topic in question they will just attack you personally and <laughs> probably a lot of you have been through this. So, you know, you are rebellious, you're bitter, you're, you don't love holiness, you don't love the truth, you don't love God, you just want the world. Um, and of course, if you're a woman, Jezebel would get a mention. <laughs> but vanity and pride will be brought up. And then in extreme cases, if you have someone who has just got no filter at all, and they do exist, and sometimes they rise to power in these movements, they might even accuse you of having nefarious sexual motives. So, you know, you might be saying, well, look, I just, I feel like it's not wrong for a woman to wear pants. I've always wanted to go zip lining. And so instead of wearing a skirt with leggings, all bunched up in the harness, which are gonna look like you have pants on anyway, I'm just gonna wear a pair of pants. And they will say, that's not what this is about. You're, you're not, 
you know, you're not just worried about modesty. You lost all that weight and you just want to put a pair of pants on so people can see your shape and they can, that men will look at your figure and blah, 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 blah. And so women are so often accused of trying to get male attention with the clothes they wear. And it, it's, <laughs> it's mean hearted. And these mean hearted accusations are just tactics. They're tactics to intimidate and to shame you into silence because they don't want to talk about this and into compliance because it's very important for them that you do what they want you to do. They want to force you into a defensive posture, bury the issue, and to just kind of gain control of the conversation without having to convincingly defend their position from scripture. So here you are, you know, you're, you're hurt, you're kind of shocked by the mean things they said, and you get so lost in defending yourself that you lose focus on the original topic. It's a smart play on their part, and it happens often. And they may even attack you with such confidence and get so personal that it, it rattles you and you, you start doubting and re-examining your own character and motives. Like you might think, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe I am lukewarm, you know, maybe I'm just seeing what I want to see in scripture so I can do this thing I want to do or, they're right, you know, I did used to feel convicted over this and maybe my questions are just me seeing how close to the world I can get, you know, basically making you gaslight yourself. But in reality, you might have thought you felt convicted when you were young in faith, but you might have actually mistaken social pressure to conform and your zeal at the time for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, by now you're maturing in faith, you're studying scripture, you might be realizing some of these verses in proper context do not mean what you used to think they did or even what you were taught they did. You also probably recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit better in your life because you're maturing as a Christian. And I would uh suggest maybe you are not backsliding maybe you are growing and maturing in faith which is bringing up questions and deeper dives into scripture and if you're conscientious about pleasing god and doing what's right this accusing tactic works very well and I will also say, if you struggle with people pleasing, that adds a whole other layer of impact. So the intent of this attack and this conflict is for you to be uncomfortable enough to back down. And I've seen authoritarian faith leaders punish nonconformists by sowing seeds of suspicion of you in your faith community, basically a smear campaign. And, and this is all part of the gaslighting, you know, and they'll have you and others questioning your spirituality, your motives, your character. They'll market you as a troublemaker when all you did was come to a different conclusion than them about something that is unclear and non-essential in scripture. And I have seen leaders systematically burn a person's entire support system to the ground around them for daring to speak up or disobey. And when I say I've seen it, I have seen it and I have experienced it and it is not fun. And they do this all while making the person look like the one in the wrong. There are some people, there is no hope. They are reprobates, that's it. They have blasphemed, they blaspheme the Holy Ghost. There is no hope for them. The Lord sends a delusion, they believe a lie. We cannot pray for them, they are lost. And don't you get fooled by things that you see because social media can paint a pretty picture and people can portray, I'm happy. Oh, I have freedom. Oh, I have oh liberty. You know, I still love God too. And, um, but they are lost and there is no hope for some of them. All of that nonsense, spiritualabuse.org, all, all of that stuff, escaping 350, utopia, blog posts, all that stuff. They are, they're just going after anybody associated with Jesus name. And some people don't have the full truth that they're going after. They're going after anybody. He specifically is trying to come against Bishop Jackson in this church, and it's not working. And I want to remind you of that, that we are in the perfect will of God. God knows exactly what is going on, and judgment has already fallen on that young man. Just because we don't see it doesn't mean that judgment is already there. It is crazy making, and you realize very quickly that it is impossible to defend yourself because toxic leaders have spent a long time grooming the saints. The saints esteem the leader probably more highly than they should, and they're slick. Like they really are slick. They know how to, how to play a situation and how to work things 
to make themselves look like they're they're the ones in the right. And many saints are blindly loyal to pastors. And I, I will add this too. Um, they're not just blindly loyal. I think some of them have aspirations for themselves or for their kids within this culture. And so even if they know that you're right and that something bad is being done to you, I know there are people who will just let you be thrown to the wolves because they're not going to make waves, even if it would have been the right thing to do, because they're not going to oppose the person who holds the opportunities. And so that's a thing as well. Tessa West, author of Jerks at Work, Toxic Coworkers and What to Do About Them, wrote, Gaslighters have two signature moves. They lie with the intent of creating a false reality and they cut their victims off socially. They spread gossip and take credit for other people's work and undercut others in furtherance of their own position. So if you're being demonized or lied about right now for asking questions or confronting false teaching or impropriety or abuse in your faith community, take heart. Doing the right thing will splash back on you at times, especially if you're dealing with a narcissistic leader, but it's still the right thing to do. Abuse needs to be addressed in the church and, and Christian teaching should be able to stand up to questions and Christian leaders should be able to handle theological disagreements without having temper tantrums. I've heard some pretty extreme statements made over pulpits and it doesn't hurt to look into these things that are being said. These guys are just people and they're bound to misunderstand things at times. They make mistakes at times. Sometimes they have ulterior motives. We want to be noble Bereans like in Acts 17 and not just blindly believe everything we're told. And Christians should be able to engage in a civil, respectful disagreement. You know, there is such a thing as healthy conflict. Now, I think that there's also disrespectful disagreement and there's nothing wrong with just walking away from that. You know, you don't have to stay and take abuse, but we should be able to, as Christians, have healthy disagreements. And it's normal for a believer to endeavor to understand scripture within proper context in an effort not to burden their lives with unnecessary complications and requirements. You know, it doesn't mean you want the world. It just means you're a sensible practical person who is in this thing for the long haul. Now, my second example of a gaslighting response is when theologically challenged and even provided with proof from scripture, or maybe confronted with the lack of proof they have, some people won't even bother defending their mishandling of the text, you know, likely because they know they can't, but they will default to tactics. So I have seen people instantly have an intense emotional meltdown, you know, anger or tears or the silent treatment to try to manipulate the person who is disagreeing with them into backing down. I've also uh, seen other people say, well, you just don't agree with me because you don't have the revelation yet. So, so this is like a, a tricky little sneaky tactic because they spiritualize their view. You don't have the revelation. I have a special revelation. You don't have the revelation. And so it's not like it's in scripture and you can go to scripture and you can, you know, you have something tangible to build this doctrine on and to analyze it. They have a revelation. And so, you know, how do you prove or disprove that? <laughs> And then some will say, well, seeing things their way is a matter of spiritual maturity. And how condescending is that? Again, it's not the black and white of things. And so, of course, a lot of them will define spiritual maturity as basically just all the things that they think and that makes them spiritually mature. And then the last uh, tactic that I've seen used is that you're just told you need to submit to your leader. Like it doesn't, I don't need to provide proof. If the pastor preaches it, you need to do it. He knows best. And we need to be submitted to him and obey him blindly. Ask no questions. You know, if he's wrong, he will answer to God. Well, good for him, you know, but like after 50 years of my quality of life being affected, you'll have to pardon me if I'm not just willing to blindly believe somebody on the off chance that maybe they might be right. 
I have a brain. I, I talk to God myself. I have scripture. I'm pretty sure I can figure out if some of these things are necessities. Now, I've heard leaders misapply spiritual maturity to agreeable people who adhere to all the church rules and traditions without question. Controllers absolutely love these people. They're their favorites. If you look in congregations, agreeable people are the pastor's pets. And on the flip side of that, if you don't fully comply and agree and you kind of dig into things yourself a little bit more, you are often said to be not spiritually mature. So let me just tell you, spiritual maturity is not defined by conformity to man-made rules. That would be legalism. So before sharing my third and final example, I want to mention Dr. Romani, and she's a psychologist and author who specializes in narcissism, and she has a whole bunch of videos on YouTube. I've watched so many of them. She's really good, and she doesn't just talk about narcissism. She talks kind of about everything narcissism adjacent, so gaslighting and projecting and triangulation, all, all kinds of things. So I've shared in the past that narcissists are drawn to positions of authority and there are articles online that list the top professions that narcissists are drawn to and of course it's what you would expect politicians police officers surgeons and clergy is on that list and it just makes sense right because these are roles where they are given instant authority they are praised and admired and people listen to them and look up to them so I just want to clarify, obviously, not all Christian leaders are narcissists. A lot of Christian leaders just wanted to serve and they wanted to help people and that's why they went for ministry. But the fact that this is a factor in clergy positions, I think it's something that a person needs to keep in mind as a Christian. And you need to remember that narcissists don't do things for the same reasons that the average person does. You might have wanted to help in ministry or in leadership because you want to serve or you have a talent that you want to use. You feel like God's gifted you and so you want to share that. You care about people. That is not why narcissists head for leadership positions. But anyway... <laughs> Dr. Romani mentioned the psychology acronym DARVO, and this is a tool for recognizing gaslighting. DARVO, D-A-R-V-O. So you have the D for deny, A for attack, and then R-V-O is reverse victim and offender. So DARVO, deny, attack, reverse victim and offender. And it's a deflection tactic. So let me give you an example. Have you ever brought up a serious issue to someone and they instantly deny it? And maybe you'll even present proof once they deny it. Like maybe you have screenshots or maybe, you know, you have friends who were there when this thing was done or said, or maybe you have pictures. <laughs> and so you present this proof, but then they still deny it. And then they turn on you and attack you and everything gets turned around. And instead of the issue being addressed, they start uh, saying things about you, maybe they'll bring up something you did two years ago and you're, you're this and you're that, and you find yourself in the hot seat. This is Darvo. And I think most people have been there before in some type of setting or some, some type of relationship in their life. You brought up this thing because you want some resolution and then you find yourself in the hot seat, like I said, and you're thinking, how did we get here? Like five minutes into this, I'm apologizing for things and the original issue has been buried. It makes you feel like you're in the twilight zone. And that is how gaslighters and narcissists avoid taking responsibility for anything. So keeping that in mind, my third example of a response when you point out issues in a, in a church with the rules and traditions or you disagree with them is when people will deny and downplay the obvious and they'll they'll deny believe in what they believe they'll deny that they ever said or preached what you know they said and preached or they'll deny just doing what they do and <laughs> Uh, this one's probably what I brought up because of my UPC background, because this is a pet peeve of mine. Let me give you an example. When questioned about an unusual doctrine, I've heard people say, oh, 
we don't preach fill in the blank, whatever is a requirement for salvation. You know, we don't preach speaking in tongues is a requirement for salvation, or we don't preach tithing or dress standards are requirements for salvation. But you know, you've heard several of their ministers preach those exact topics with hell attached to them. And you've observed their congregants adhering to all of it as if their lives depend on it. So, you know, and maybe, just maybe a person can say, well, my pastor doesn't preach that. And, you know, maybe he doesn't explicitly say it, but I'm sure the people in the congregation somehow, do they just know <laughs> to adhere to it. But even if your pastor doesn't preach it, you still know that these are widespread teachings in your organization. It's almost as if some beliefs from high control groups are so extreme that when the members hear them out loud, even they cringe. And, you know, they try to diminish how harsh and off-putting it sounds by basically lying. I I've always felt they want to hide those aspects from prospective new members, especially, uh, until they get them hooked in. And this is cultish behavior, burying some unpleasant facts till people get invested. That's manipulative. My father was really moved by Alicia's story. Alicia shared her, her exit story from the UPC in a video earlier this year. And he was so moved by it that he talked about it for, for a few days afterwards. It kind of bothered him because he was so heartbroken that she had spent decades worried about going to hell, even though she loved the Lord and she, you know, lived for God, but she couldn't speak in tongues. And so he spoke with a UPC or he knows about it because it was just on his mind. And he mentioned the fear and how awful it was that she had. So this UPC person got super defensive and said, well, the UPC doesn't preach that. You know, Alicia's pastor would never say that she was going to hell for not speaking in tongues. So you have to know the exact questions to ask deceitful people to force the truth out of them. So my dad, who this is not his first rodeo, he is used to this. He knew the right questions to ask. So yeah, they basically admitted, well, they do believe you need to speak in tongues to have the Holy Spirit. And yeah, they do believe that you need the Holy Spirit to be saved. And yeah, if you're not saved, hell. I mean, isn't that exactly what he said? These nitpicky word games can get so exhausting. I've frequently heard, oh, we don't require that. Anyone can come to our church and dress however they want. That's deceitful. It's gaslighting. It, you're misrepresenting. You're making it seem like reality is different from what it is. Because I know them and I am familiar with their beliefs, I can easily bring clarity here with the right questions. Yes, you can attend. They don't have bouncers at the door who will grab a lady with a necklace and earrings on and drag her out into the parking lot and throw her down in front of her vehicle. But that's not the right question. The question is, could a female believer wearing earrings lead worship or teach Sunday school? The answer is no, because they're not considered holy unless they follow the rules. Now, there might be a little wiggle room during the probationary kind of honeymoon period, but if over time you're still not persuaded to follow their rules, your only role will be to sit in the pew and put money in the plate you will be a second-class saint. You'll be unfit to lead in any way. You will not be viewed the same as everyone else. And you'll possibly even be a sermon target for the rest of your time there. So yes, anyone can physically attend and anyone can wear whatever they want, but there are several requirements to be in good standing. And they know very well that is not the question people have. People want to know, can I attend this church and be considered a Christian and kind of like an equal member to everyone else and not follow your rules? And the real answer here is no. These verbal gymnastics, they frustrate ex-members who we remember exactly what our former church culture requires, but then we're made to sound confused or like we're misrepresenting things when we just state the obvious. Now, in the group I left, some rules have changed over time, and things that used to be taboo are now allowed. But if you bring that up, 
you know, if you say, oh, wow, I see that your boys are playing organized sports and wearing knee length shorts now. That's interesting because <laughs> we were crushed over that stuff and a lot of people driven out back when I was young. Many of them will try to rewrite history. They won't admit that they were ever as radical as they were or that they were ever wrong. And I mean, this is gaslighting. So you know better when you bring it up. They know better but they're never going to humble themselves and admit that they were ever wrong. So instead they play these deceitful mind games. And that is very concerning when you're talking about Christians. Now, do you remember the RVO of Darvo, the reverse victim and offender? I've also seen sometimes in these conversations where they will play the victim. You know, they'll, they'll go, I don't know why you guys are so mean and you're so judgmental toward us. We should be able to dress and worship the way we want to. And, you know, and like, I agree. Of course you can. Of course you should be able to. But you're still responsible for the crazy things that you've taught and the people that you've driven from faith over your petty little preferences. You can't abuse people and expect to never answer for it. You also can't disqualify everyone who disagrees with you on non-essentials and expect nobody to challenge you on it. You don't get to turn your personal preferences into essentials without solid scriptural support. And abusers will use these deflection tactics to make you the problem. And if you have spent very long in an unhealthy faith environment, you've likely spent years being groomed and conditioned to be agreeable and to constantly re-examine your motives and to be quick to accept blame and responsibility for anything. And the more blame you accept, the more abusers will recognize they can heap blame on you. And I will add this, some people have grown up in very unhealthy homes. And it has set them up to be more submissive, more suggestible, and more comfortable in a toxic situation. Spiritual gaslighting implies the problems not that they're overstepping scripture or mishandling abuse. The real problem is you. It's your bitterness and you know, or your unforgiveness towards your abuser or your unsubmissiveness to the leader. You're just bringing up these issues to retaliate or to make them look bad. And that one is especially if you've left and you mention anything. They'll also act like any criticism of a leader is a witch hunt. They accuse you of misrepresenting the issue. Like I said before, you know, well, you're confused or you're remembering situations differently than what they were. And they'll say that your diminished spiritual state has you operating with evil motives. And so sometimes they'll get helpful. Like <laughs> they'll give you some solutions to help with your spiritual issues. They'll tell you, pray about it. You know, you just, you have problems with this. Well, you just need to pray about it. Like as if you haven't been. Or, well, you just need to obey. God honors obedience. Well, I mean, that's a little vague, right? Like obedience to who? And for everything, just arbitrary obedience across the board to anybody who tells you to do anything. Or you'll get the kind of the suck it up buttercup <laughs> response where they say, God doesn't want you to be happy. He wants you to be holy, you know, and it's always kind of snarky. And that's kind of their way of just saying, Nobody cares that you're struggling here. Just do what you're told. And they'll also use guilt and fear because of course, they're favorite tactics. And I found they can get kind of uh, passive aggressive, we'll say. I've heard them say, well, I'll do anything God asks, no matter the cost. Well, <laughs> good for you, me too. But I just wanna make sure it's God asking and not you. Or they'll say, well, I just don't find fill in the blank burdensome. You know, I just want to live a holy life as if the rest of us don't. I don't find skirts, wearing skirts all the time burdensome. I just don't, you know, but be honest. Some of this stuff is burdensome. I've heard them say anything you can do, I can do in a skirt. <laughs> right. Okay. But why would you want to unless you had to? There's no prize in heaven for having lived the most needlessly complicated life. I've also heard people say, well, I'd rather do too much than too little or better safe than sorry, implying there's danger in not doing enough. 
And this one always makes me sad. You know, these are people who don't understand the basic gospel, the foundation of the Christian faith. I might worry about not doing enough if I had to produce my own salvation, but thank God for the beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, he paid it all. He paid the entire penalty for my sin, and it was a death penalty. And that is the only way I get eternal life is through him because I just couldn't earn it myself. Now, true salvation does produce good works. You've had a, a change of heart, but my salvation is not dangling by a thread based on my behaviors. I'm not capable of being good or holy enough to earn eternal life. It's either the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the holiness of Jesus Christ, or it's nothing because this is way out of my league. And to assume it's not is arrogant. I think that if you're assuming it's not, you underestimate the holiness of God. You underestimate the worthlessness of your own efforts by comparison and you underestimate the gravity of sin. It's, it's Jesus. Jesus paid it all. It's all on him. And another warning that you'll sometimes get if you're bringing up these issues is the slippery slope fallacy. And I mean, there are so many. I, I could spend a five hour video and probably there'd still be arguments that I left out, but I'm just kind of touching on some of the more common ones. So this is the slippery slope fallacy. So if you do this one thing, it's going to lead you to terrible places. So if you start wearing wedding rings, then you'll get so vain and so worldly that you'll start wearing bikinis to church. And then the bikinis to church will make you cheat on your husband. And then before you know it, you'll be dating a Satan worshiper and worshiping the devil. So, you know, this is all from a wedding ring or something, you know, something equally as extreme. And it would be so different if they would just look at things from a personal conviction, Christian liberty standpoint. And if they would say, look, you know, I choose not to wear wedding rings for personal reasons or as a, a personal sacrifice to God. Cool. Nobody has a problem with that. Or I just don't drink alcohol personally, but I don't judge those who enjoy, uh, you know, an occasional glass of wine in moderation. People can respect that. Or I don't wear pants because I'm more comfortable in dresses. Or maybe they'd say, well, I have uncut hair because I don't fully understand the hair passage in 1 Corinthians 11. And that's just the safest way I can see to interpret it. But I understand that that is not every Christian's perspective. That is perfectly cool. You would never get pushback. People would respect your position. But the reason people push back on these non-essentials is because you can't support them clearly with scripture and you don't treat them like personal convictions. If you're demanding the rest of us comply with your personal convictions, they're not personal. And they do that. They, they do demand it or they will strip you of your salvation and question your character and integrity and and, you know, try to fill you with fear. And this happens especially to new converts during the makeover phase of their conversion. And it's inappropriate. You're doing damage, you're crossing healthy boundaries, and you're overwhelming and discouraging people over things that do not matter. And you don't like that it makes some of us vocal. So you try to shut down the conversation using all of these other tactics. But I would contend that you are placing debris on the path to Jesus, and I'll always push back on that. Most gaslighting in high control groups is a result of people like me pushing back on them for trying to turn non-essential doctrines into essentials around leaders exerting unhealthy control and around abuse that they will not properly deal with. And I really believe that if they were walking in the fruit of the spirit, it would take care of all three of those issues. We would just, as the Christian community, the body of Christ, the ecclesia, the worldwide body, we would be loving one another, getting along, allowing room for personal convictions and for differences of opinion. And we would be minding our own business like it recommends in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 12. Now about brotherly love, you do not need anyone to write to you because you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. And you are indeed showing this love to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, 
brothers, to excel more and more, and aspire to live quietly, to attend to your own matters, and to work with your own hands as we instructed you. Then you will behave properly toward outsiders without being dependent on anyone. So this sounds to me like the ideal Christian is loving, they live a quiet life, they work at maintaining and providing for their own household and they mind their own business and this would include pastors they're not busybodies they're not trying to run everyone else's life so i hope this video helps you better recognize grooming and gaslighting in a religious setting and maybe it will pique your interest to look further into the psychological tactics of controllers and abusers you know, that's great for being a person at work, being in the church, just even your interpersonal relationships. I feel like when we're better informed, we're less likely to be intimidated and manipulated. So I will say if you find yourself in a manipulative conversation, try not to get drawn out into the weeds. That's their goal. Hold to your original point, but you probably need to realize that you're likely wasting your time. People like this are rarely honest because being right is more important to them than doing what's right. And so most will never ever take responsibility for hurting people or wrong teaching or abuse or mishandling a situation or, you know, they don't take responsibility for much. And this is the mindset that drives people out of unhealthy churches because you start feeling the effects of being disapproved of and disbelieved and disrespected and it wears you out and it breaks you down. And so you choose to leave to save your own sanity. And there is no shame in removing yourself from spiritual abuse. A person is wise to pursue peace. And if you leave, it's wise to take some time to heal and just process everything you've experienced. And we've talked here today about grooming and gaslighting, but maybe research triangulation and blame shifting and scapegoating and, you know, trauma bonding. There are many factors that can play into why you've been so hurt and why you feel so confused in some of these situations. And it might surprise you how many of these things you've experienced, even in the church. And I mentioned her before, but Dr. Romani is a great resource. And there are other psychologists who have good information out there on YouTube videos as well. I think becoming trauma informed would be very eye opening for you and give you some insight as well. And of course, therapy can be helpful in situations like this. We underestimate how much damage a faith community and a spiritual leader can do to someone. So I'm going to close this out by saying, may we have the discernment and hopefully wise counsel in our life to recognize false teaching. And should abuse rear its ugly head in our faith community, may we have the wisdom to just recognize when pursuing resolution and reconciliation isn't working and the courage to leave when and if that time comes. So if you enjoyed this video, you can like it, share it, and if you want YouTube to let you know when I post a new one, you can hit subscribe and the notification bell and they will do that. So I hope everyone has a great day.